didn't take long and then I had a doctor in my room and they listened to me and uh, then when you see nurses and doctors running then you know it's bad are this person gonna make it is it even gonna be okay one day or the paralyzed what do we have to change do we have to move there's so many more life questions on my worst day or on a bad day for instance if I can walk in my stable here and I have to say okay it's a long day it's hard work there's someone out in this world that would do anything to have my bad day yeah. to just switch his life to have that day but to myself you know this is why people love horses the whole process put such a highlight on life yes then take two deep breath clear and yes feel alive and then you will walk on and you feel so much better this episode of tot the podcast is brought to you by Electric tractors. G'day guys, welcome back to TRT the podcast. I have a very special episode here for you today. It's going to be an episode that is going to inspire you for sure. It's going to move you. There will probably be moments where it'll be quite emotional. It's going to be a very reflective episode. It's going to be an episode full of profound, priceless life nuggets my guest today has been a great friend of mine for many years we don't always get to catch up with each other as much as we'd like to but this man is definitely someone that i've been able to call on and count on on many occasions over the years he's a man that has done the hours he's dedicated himself to his craft he knows the business he's a self-made man running his own successful business here in the heart of oldenburg Germany together with his beautiful wife. This man, this man has been part of many bits of my journey along the way. He's been a main arena leader of the applause and crowd participation at many of our demos. He's played some of the most famous roles, including the Swedish croc hunter, the Swedish snake handler, Chucky the chainsaw killer, Herman, the Piaffing German, he was also the star whipcracker in our first big virtual event in COVID times. He is a man that I recommended to most or not all of my best and most low like clients when I was recently closed in my training stable. He is still the man that I recommend people to send their young horses to to be started. And he's just recently become my superhero along with a lot of other people and let me tell you when you hear this man's story he will certainly become your superhero as well christopher nelson welcome to trt podcast thank you for having me <laughs> finally yeah so i want to uh before we get into the juicy stuff i i want to reminisce a little bit i want to uh yeah talk about uh how we met actually how we met which was, I don't even know how many years ago that was now, but it was quite some time ago. That'd be close to a decade. And I think it was actually something with Morton Thompson. Yeah. Bringing me up to Denmark, you have to meet this guy, Tristan. He is amazing to start the horse. And see, that's the past of my oh. Yeah, because I think at that time you were here you in the stable working for Captain and Dad. Yep. That's and I, I remember you came up the first time actually with Catherine, I think. You were looking at some late young horses. Yeah, I think something like that, yeah. And what would that be? It must be more than 12 years ago or something like that. Yeah, maybe, maybe more, ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, back in the day. Yeah, yeah back in the days, yeah. yeah. And then, of course, you came up. Catherine actually sent you for a stint. Yeah. And we were driving around like man men, yes. breaking in horses all around Denmark. That was when we were normal guys, <laughs> swinging, <laughs> driving around, swinging on horseback, doing uh, the the yeah. human curry comb technique. How many horses could we lay up on in ten minutes? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Those sorts of things. I um, I do remember specifically one time at a clinic where you were, um, you came down. We had to give a, a major clinic. 
the next day mm -hmm. and I think you right you know normal situation you arrived at at uh, nine and ten in the evening or something after running your stable and mm. of course we called on you you didn't let us down you were there and you're like so what's the plan um yeah uh, we're gonna do that now <laughs> we don't have a plan yet <laughs> plan it plan we're having a before. show we're having a show in a few hours but let's work something yeah. out yeah and i just remember there was one time you were playing the uh swedish steve Irwin, god bless his soul and we were gem demonstrating like the fear the fear factor in a horse yeah. you know and that simple thing of coming up the center line and what does a horse feel yeah. and we set it up i remember it so clearly we set it up that we actually had a pair of reins on on of course we scan the crowd first and we we ask questions about what people are afraid of are you afraid of dangerous animals in australia blah blah, blah. and then we pick out the one that looks most fearful in the crowd you put a set of reins on her yeah and uh and i remember you were dressed as the swedish snake handler like just like one of those daytime shows where somebody comes with a dangerous bush animal yeah and i just remember having the reins on this woman and you coming out and pretending that you had a snake in the back and i mean you played it so well i like had a bag in the whole nine yards. i had to it looked like a real good bag and there were we had a toy snake in it yeah but yeah, but I, yeah, I just remember how well you played it, and that the woman, I could feel that I was thinking, damn, this Chris is doing a good. This woman's going to have a real heart she attack. She almost <laughs> left her either. <laughs> so that was, uh, I remember those times really, really well. It was, uh, it was a well planned show. Yeah, yeah, we had some well. We never knew it was without a catch. Yeah, exactly. it was like we came in and we did it. Exactly, and of course the lesson from uh, Adam Wimrich, the whip cracking demo, yeah. always yeah. a lot of fun. But I'm I'm really grateful that I can sit with you here, mate. Also because we don't get to do it that often. And and it's always nice to reminisce about those times and we've spent a lot of time together and we've, you know, very often talk on the phone about horses and situations and Yep. The industry that has fed us in many ways and we've been down many paths together where we, we run the normal drill of working like hell and uh doing a lot of horses and the body's getting a bit broken and what can we do to make it a little bit easier? <laughs> what can we do to sort of make sure we survive at the end of this passion that we're so uh, driven by? But, of course, what I'd really love to get into today, and I think this is, we, we've had, we had a conversation not that long ago. Um, so I want to get into the past four or so months of your life because this for me is, um, yeah, I think it's something that is, it's it's something I think that, people shouldn't have to go through to have the realizations that you explained to me you had on the phone. Yeah. Which was, which is, which is silly in a way. Um, and I don't want to give anything away prematurely. So let's start in the beginning. You, you've got a successful business. You've got quite some amazing clients. You've, you were competing successfully. I think you'd just recently been out to a, a show and the young horses were incredibly well. So everything's actually going well, well, Really, really well. I, I couldn't complain. Yeah, and so and so, what was what went on from there? How did it begin? It began. It was late February, and I was like, "Hmm, my feet feels a little bit funny. It's like my feet were sleepy." And I was like, "Maybe I slept wrong, pinched nerve, like bad nerve, like pins in the exactly a little bit mm -hmm. when you you sit on the sofa wrong and you your feet are like yeah." You're about to go to sleep. Yeah, yeah. That's the feeling I had, and I couldn't really shake it off. I didn't really wake up. I was like, ah, you know, it can't be that bad. Keep on working. And you kind of forgot about it, and it got a little bit better during the day, and then, you know, it worked. And I was like, ah. Then he climbed higher up in the leg, and you know, my calves getting sore. I was like, that's like I've been running a marathon or two. I was like, okay, this is not normal. How about you, you still rode the young horses? You did your thing. You forgot about it. So you rode a full day. Oh yeah, yeah. I did everything. It just kept going on for a couple of days, and it just got worse and worse. And I'm like, okay, something has to change. Something is wrong here. I remember we had some people here over the weekend. I rode. It was a Sunday. I rode the horses, and I was like, okay, now it's spreading. You get higher up in my legs. 
I'm really hurting. My legs are hurting. My hands are starting to hurt. I had this feeling in my hands, the same feeling when you put your hands through a jacket arm. You feel all this ice cold feeling in your hand when you put your arm pan through mm -hmm. the jacket arms. I was like, okay, something is wrong. So it's a Sunday, nothing happens in Germany. So to say, so I was like, okay, tomorrow I have to do something. So the next day shows up and I had a hard time getting out of bed. And I went to the doctor and they're like, yep, the pop. As something is for sure not right with you. So the, I, you're the normal doctor you went to? I went to a normal doctor and she's like, prescribe me to do an MRT. And I was like, that could be first, there was a Monday, something like that, and it could be done first on Thursday. So I was like, okay, just a couple more days and I'll be fine. And I was like, that was one of the hardest week in my life because I was hurting bad. I can hardly walk because it was hurting so bad. And I was like, I'm trying to stretch. I was like, my muscles are so tight. I don't know what I've done, but the muscles are tight. At that point you thought, yeah, I've, I've I, done something. Yeah, exactly. something. I didn't, for sure. I didn't Google because you don't Google about your sickness because then you're about to die next day. Yeah. So I was like, something's not right. So I went to a different doctor because in the horse business, you know, one person who knows one person and then you get sent into a specialist there. Yeah. And I remember coming into his office and he's like, took a one look at me. He's like, okay, so you're not good. And I was like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not good. But, uh, you look like shit. Uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit like that. That's what he basically said. Good bedside manner. And uh, I remember I had to stand on my toes and I was like, yeah, I could stand on my toes. And of course I couldn't, which surprised me when you stand in the doctor office and he asks you, please stand on your toes. And you think, yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm right. I could stand on my toes. So as I couldn't, and then he said, can you stand on your heels to lean back, so to say? Of course I can, you know, I do it every day. Hell no. I could not get up on my toes, so I could get, not get over my heels. And he's like, okay, lay down here. And then he takes out like a pressure point thing. It's like, yeah. Like a reflex. Yeah, exactly. So he push, either you have two pressure points, or you have one. Mm -hmm. And he like did that all over my stomach, my legs and my back. And I was like. And then he asked me, he said, can you feel two pressure points or is it just one? So, so, not a damn clue. I could not feel like if it was two points or if it's one point, I had no, I couldn't feel. So I was like, I can't just feel you. This is on your legs. Every, all your legs, the stomach. Oh. And uh, I was like, I cannot feel, I can only feel pressure. Yeah. And he said, okay, that's enough. I'm sending you to the hospital right away to the neurology department of the yeah. hospital. So we don't have it here in FECTA, so he sent me to the next city, Quarkenburg it's called. And uh, yeah, that's where we ended up. We came in as an emergency patient. And if you come in and as an emergency patient, there's always something going on, but yeah. we were sitting there for hours waiting. And uh, I remember as soon as we, you feel at that point, you know, it just getting worse and worse. My, I can hardly walk at this point. I can like, I struggle to even get up to the ER. You sat there, we sat there so waiting. like a period of. It's the last day, the 24 hours, the last day was really yeah. tough. It went really fast because I ignored it in the beginning because I was like, you know how it is. You know, we, yeah. we work in. Yeah, sometimes. body problems. Yeah. yeah, exactly. It's, you hurt a little bit here and there. Yeah. I didn't think so much of it. And, but the last. 48 hours, 24 hours were really bad. And sitting in the hospital, you know something is wrong with you, especially when you have a doctor that's really giving you the eyes and like, what the hell have you been doing? You should have been in a week ago. Yeah. So uh, I got in there in the room and I remember the doctor asked me if I've been sick or anything like that. And I was like, no, I've not been sick. And then he asked me to do this test you know if you hold your hands out and you have to close your eyes and you hit your nose hit your nose here yeah. and i remember i did i was thinking i hit my yeah. nose and i was like way off yeah and i remember that point too my wife is standing next to me is like christopher stop you're serious and i was like i am dead serious i'm trying to i'm doing my best here and i yeah. could not pull my face even i was like i'm thinking my mind is saying you're right spot on but your body is doing something totally different there yeah. And uh, then they came with their smaller hammers. They all have hammers in their pockets, so doctors. 
and they do these reflex songs on your knees, your elbows, I have it even on your wrist, you know, and I had no reaction, nothing. And they made hammering and then when you have one doctor to say, we get a special case in the ER, you should come try this out. And then you, all of a sudden you get doctors lined up. And all the students, all, all of everyone, all the hammer everyone wants to try to see what happens if you um, hit this guy with a hammer. Yeah. Nothing shows up. And that was, um, I think I had, I was plenty of doctors uh, and yeah. tried. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, uh, and I have went down to the basement because I got a fast MRT done. Yeah. They scanned my whole, um, spine for whatever they Injury. were looking for. Exactly. Yeah. Whatever they were looking for. Yeah. And, um, by the end of the, I was probably there for two, three hours and they start to come up with the diagnosis for what I could have. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they came up with something called the uh, Miller Fisher syndrome yeah. first. And uh, that is a um, daughter cousin to the Guillain Barre syndrome yeah. that I was later diagnosed with. Yeah. But that's where it all started. And they said, please don't Google it. That's what they said to me in the hospital because I was, how do you spell it? And I was like, please don't Google it. Yeah, yeah. And um, it's a disease that goes for your your nerves, your whole yeah. nervous system. Yeah. It's uh, your so, antibodies in your body doesn't know what's good and what's bad. And yeah. they're basically destroying themselves. And with that, they're also destroying the, the nerve, the nerve uh, bending, the yeah. mucilin, I think yeah. it's called. Yeah. And uh, so my, my brain is telling me, move your right leg. And it's sending the impulse. Yeah. But because the nerve is damaged, yeah. The nerves doesn't really go fully the way off. Yeah. And, um, yeah. So how quickly did they diagnose you with that then? That was there at the... Yeah, exactly. Your in the ER. They, yeah. they diagnosed me quite fast. I got to say that because I had... I got to give it that. That was basically very, very well skilled doctors. Yeah. They were thinking outside the box instead of just thinking, oh, okay, he's got... He hurt himself or something. They were really thinking outside their box. And, yeah. uh... Because yeah, I remember probably a little bit further i remember you um sent me a text i was flying back from somewhere and i got the text from you it's like call me when you get it call me back when you get a chance mate i've learned something new and then you said to me you know you have to appreciate the little things yeah and i landed or whatever and and i, and I saw the missed call and i said something dumb like oh yeah what have you learned mm -hmm. and then you sent me that photo when you were lying, that was that there in the hospital? I just oh, remember yeah, in the, the photo. I was like, "That's in the hospital." You you had like guard two garden hose pipes now hanging out of your neck. Yeah, and then the other one was you were lying on the bed with this it's a machine. With this, yeah, the big. Machine. But that exactly that came five days later because I was in the hospital. They diagnosed me fast. Okay, this, the day after they had to do more testing because that was like late at night now. Yeah. And I remember it was a Thursday because it was perfectly aimed for the weekends, I'd say. So Friday, we did a lot of tests to uh, basically eliminate other diseases. Yeah. I had to do like chest x-rays for my lungs, my heart. And uh, they did... Um, to be sure that... To be sure what they were doing. It's yeah. A little bit like a vet would work, you know, you had to eliminate other things. Yeah. And um, I did a spinal tap not the most comfortable no it's not most comfortable but he, he did well i gotta yeah. say that you feel a pressure in your back and the the fluid comes out yeah it's a weird feeling yeah and then you had to lay flat for i had to lay there for two three hours he said yeah. i was like yeah. don't move and um but the worst part was when i had to measure how fast my nerves are grown that you do with uh, electric therapy or electricity or whatever they want to call it and if you work with horses, you know, do not touch the electric fence. <laughs> and that's like, and that's basically how I felt what they did. They hook you up with needles and sending electricity through your Put legs. needles in you. Oh, yeah, they had to, to measure, you they had to measure a muscle, how fast I mean, a muscle can send a nerve out. And that was also with the, there was electricity and he's like, every time he had to push the button, I can hear you. It's like an old keyboard and he pushed the enter right. button. He knew it was coming. Like a Chinese torch. Yeah, a little bit like that. I mean, I'm already, I'm paranoid to touch some yeah. gates sometimes yeah. in case. But that was the worst. Like I said, that was, 
It was a killing because it was not just once. It was like he said, I don't know how many times. One session was like 12, you know, yeah. pushing, come after each other. And it was different times, not to you later and be like counting two seconds and then we'll come. It was different. One to come fast, yeah. then to go a bit longer. Like one of, uh, exactly. Reading. Yeah. yeah. And then all I can say is like, your nerves are really slow. There's for sure damage on your nerves. Yeah. And that's why you're suffering what you're suffering right now. Yeah. So that's how they really diagnosed me with Guillain Barré syndrome. Yeah. Because he eliminated a little bit different. So the Miller Fisher syndrome was just out, and now it's Guillain Barré syndrome. Yeah. And, um, but they said a positive thing is there is a treatment for it. It's uh, immune globin. You can get um, through um, IV. Yeah. And you have three a day for five days, and then you should be feeling better. So I was like, great. It's Friday. We're starting already. So I was like, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. So I called my wife and I said, don't worry about it, honey. I get medication. They know what it is. I'll be home. I'll, right. be, I'll, I'll be home. Clean the boxes. Thursday, Friday. Don't worry about it. Yeah. They're going to keep you five days. Well, I'll be fine. Weekend comes and I had three days of this medicine. It's not getting better. I'm just basically getting worse. At this time, I'm not allowed to walk anymore. The doctors banned me for walking on my own because they're afraid I'm just going to fall down yeah. and break a leg because then... You have a fracture a year about for a lot even longer. Yeah, yeah. So I was not allowed to do that. And um, fourth day, my wife is telling me, you sound weird. It sounds like you have water in your lungs. It's, I hear it in your voice. And don't worry about it. It's, it's not that bad. And then in the fifth day, I remember that we're having the normal dinner at 12 o'clock in the hospital. And I had a hard time swallowing. And I was like, okay, this is not good. Now I'm, I don't know what it is, but something is for sure, it's choking me. It felt like I was choking, but for nothing. It's not like I had a piece of big meat or anything. It was just basically hospital food. It, it's very easy going. Yeah. And I was like, okay, this is not good. Uh, you push a button, the nurse come in. And I was like, I think you're having a problem swallowing and maybe breathing. It didn't really hit me like I'm breathing, like I'm having a fight to, to take a breath. Yeah. But I felt like, mm, maybe I'm starting to fill up with something. And as soon as I said that, she's like, okay, don't worry about it. And I saw she rushed out and like a faster walk pace than normal. Yeah. And didn't take long. And then I had a doctor in my room and they listened to me. And um, then when you see nurses and doctors running, then you know it's bad. Yeah. And then it's like, Christopher, you're going down to ICU. And, uh, yeah. Then they basically released the brakes on the bed and they pushed me out of this room. And I basically said goodbye to my friends you made in the hospitals. Like yeah. that. And they're like, what's wrong with you? Was, I don't know. I don't think it's that bad. I'll be back. Don't worry about it. I'll see you tomorrow. Were you, yeah. were you in that mindset? Yeah, I was really? like, I don't know what's going on. I was like, yeah, they're probably just going to keep me overnight for observation. That's what I was thinking. Yeah. And uh, they took me down to the intensive care unit. And there I met a very good doctor. She took one good look at me and said, okay, this um, immune globin didn't really work on you. The antikorper antibodies didn't have the effect they should have. Normally you should be feeling a lot better after five days. Yep. But uh, for you, it's something different. We have to do something else. So um, they like decided to do um, something they call the blood wash, and, uh, and that's after the photos that I yeah used exactly to be that's there. after five days. But I was like, I'm, I didn't have to call anyone for five days. I'll be like, I didn't even send you photos at the first time because yeah. you know, I'll be back in five days. Yeah. But now it's you look getting more serious. So I was like, okay. But um, the doctor said we're starting blood wash now, because the other doctor said, don't worry, it's going to maybe take a little bit more days yeah. some days you know five days is not enough maybe you need seven days yeah but she said no we're starting now because i see that he's not doing well and do, we don't want to push it so far that we have to into intubate him yeah that's what they said and uh boom and i felt quite i was very weak at this point and i remember they get um it's like late at night they call some doctor in 
and he had to put this big catheter in my neck because you had to prepare for the blood wash. Well, that's with the two big hoses yeah, out of my yeah. neck. And yeah, they, they numbed my, my neck, so to say. And they, you have to, with the scalpel, you have to yeah. open up the skin and you have yeah. to dig in there. And then I gotta say, I saw this big thing and I was like, that doesn't fit in my neck. That's my first thing when I saw it. I was like, what's going in? In my neck, it's like this thing. I was like, holy shit, that's like bigger than there. Yeah. What we use for ors. He's like, don't worry about it, you won't feel a thing. And as I said, you know, they numb my neck and I was pretty much out of it anyway. I had enough drugs in my system. And he said, flip over on your side. And I had to lay like that and yeah, pushed it in. There. When I saw that photo in the beginning, I was, yeah, because of course I was in this state of going, oh, yeah, what'd you learn, mate? And then I got that photo. I was like, holy hell, he's got like, Two garden hoses, like some serious pipes hanging out of his neck. Yeah. I just want to go through, um, just just so people get an idea a little bit. So GBS, guillain barre disease, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's an acute paralytic polyneuropathy, so, which means it's uh, affecting the peripheral nervous system. It causes a quick onset of symmetrical, meaning both sides evenly ascending weakness, which you just mentioned. A loss of feeling in the feet, which travels up through the body, which eventually affects your sensory neuropathy. So it's a me uh, molecular mimicry, so which means that the body creates antibodies against bacteria, which match the proteins of your nerve cells. So it mis mistakenly starts to attack and kill your own nervous system, which means it's not diagnosed or attended to quickly which luckily yeah they require you mm -hmm. it can lead to devastating paralysis to the point where the person is not able to walk or even breathe independently so it's life-threatening mm -hmm. and more than 20 p people more than 20 percent of people diagnosed with gbs do not fully recover and need permanent assistance to walk so you know when you i remember when you sent that the first thing I did was call, uh, I tried to call you mm -hmm. and you were in the middle of a blood wash, obviously. Yes. So I called Casey and, um, I also just immediately got this because then I Googled. Yeah. I didn't Google in the beginning. I Googled afterwards and then I spoke to Casey and then I got this very new found respect because I was imagining, you know, the position you've been in and everything's going well and then thinking bang like oh how is this possible how can chris be lying in the bed and not able to walk and he's got you know these garden hoses hanging out of his neck in case he's like yeah yeah it's um yeah you know he's chris will be all right just he's probably going through his blood wash now and he'll give you a call a little bit later i was just like she was like so cool and calm you know and then you gave me the call back and then I was like, oh yeah, he's able to call. Okay. I saw your, your number calling and I had also that bit of relief there. Like, oh, he's okay. okay. Oh, okay. So get on the phone. And I remember you saying that, um, you know, one minute you're at the show and everything's going great. And then someone rips the carpet underneath you. And in one second, your whole life can changes, can, can change in one minute. Yeah. And I remember you also telling me that it's the difficulty of now being in hospital bed, not being able to do the things you normally do. I remember you telling me the nurses there, all your, all your dignity is stripped. Nurses are there washing you like a pair of, washing the sand off a pair of tendon boots in the wash bay. Yeah, you feel and, that way, but they're doing a good job. But you feel when you're my age, you lay in there, you can do everything on your own. And all of a sudden you can't do anything. Yeah. Even like the smallest thing, you know, I lost my phone or I lost my, my headphones or something because my hands are there, but they're not working anymore. I could not even hold a glass. I couldn't, I couldn't even do that because everything, my body or my, my body is not responding to what my head is telling it. My brain is functioning very well, but it's telling you to grab the cup. There's no way because it didn't, the nerves didn't send that signal to the hand. Yeah. So everything I have to do, you have to like ring a button and like, nurse, please come. And that 
beauty with um, the intensive care unit is like there's always a nurse like basically outside your door. So that felt really safe. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and it was a rough time, rough time. And the blood wash also takes a two, good two hours, I think. Yeah. And then you had to get the blood back in because there's so much blood in the yeah. machine and you have to get the blood back to your body it takes another so the process is they basically you, you've got the garden pipes hanging out and of course your blood your heart mm -hmm. starts pumping mm -hmm. because they basically open the tap yeah, that's, that's how it feels like because also with this disease it affects your the whole nervous system so that's why i got they check my heart and stuff like that because it, they were afraid it's going to go for my heart and my lungs and take you know the nervous system we don't even think about breathing our right. nervous system, it does Do it automatically. It yeah. So they were afraid it's going to go for that and basically cut my breathing out or the heart will stop or it do on, on rhythm. Yeah. So that's what I get checked a lot for. And I remember with the, with the open the garden hose, so that's how it feels like because they hooked the machine up and it was beeping and all that. And it feels like it's connecting two hoses and then they basically let start and then they open and you feel this blood pumping out of you. And uh, it feels like you're going to die in the beginning because it feels like your blood is leaving your, your body, going into the machine. And before you have, your blood is coming back. It feels like there's probably never really a gap or anything, but uh, yeah. it felt like it goes really fast to get rid of your blood in yeah. your system. Because I'm like 80 kilos, I should have around 8 liters of blood. Yeah. But it felt like that machine just ate 4 liters like that. And you just... Yeah. I never got it back. That's what it felt like. So you lay there and be like, holy shit. The blood is just, it's like someone opened a tap and before the machine got it. And uh, like was, someone's take. Yeah, that's how it felt like. And yeah. uh, the machine had a, some kind of special filter that collected all antibodies. And uh, then you get, that's how it cleaned out everything. Yeah. It, I, basically all the medicine I got this machine basically cleaned out. So he cleaned out whatever it's good or bad. He cleaned out everything. Yeah. And then, yeah. And what's the normal process? And they normally do that like two, three times? Or? I think the normal process were like four or five. And I had seven. Yeah. Yeah, they were not happy with the first <laughs> treatment, I guess. And I got to say, from the beginning... So what is the, the first, what is the mindset then when you... you like the how beginning, quick that like, that happens and then all of a sudden you're on this machine they're pumping all of your blood out and i can imagine it's totally draining like you must be yeah i was for sure you feel a bit dizzy and groggy in a way mm. and i had amazing medicine you know i hardly felt pain or anything and every time i felt pain you had an open iv they basically gave me something for pain because they said you're in the hospital you should not feel pain yeah so i was like okay you say it sister <laughs> i'm yeah. ringing the bell then so every time, you know, I had pain in my hands and my feet and in my whole body, basically. So every time that tranquilizer, they basically gave me tranquilizer to basically yeah. cut down my nerves. Yeah. Because the nerves doesn't really know what is hurting or not. Yeah. That's how it feels like. So I was laying down. It's like, for some reason, my hands are really hurting and my legs feel weird and they're also hurting. It's like you have ants in your, in your system. Yeah. And um, so they gave me something for it, and you slept really well for a while there. But the thing is, when you lay in the hospital, you lose this time you sleep at night, yeah. and then you wake during the day. In the hospital, you do nothing. You yeah. basically sleep when you can sleep. And so um, so I know you're, the, the, the sort of remarkable sequence of events that took place to where you are now. But can you remember back, like the, the first step, the beginning of the mindset in that, like the feeling, the thoughts of, of... I was just thinking, okay, this thing is not gonna win over me. I have to like take control of so this was the initial thought I have, from the beginning. I was thinking like in the first, the with the medicine, I'm just like, okay, babe, I'll be in, back in the stable in five yeah, days. Yeah. So I was like, this is nothing, I won't beat this. And I still, at this point, I haven't really Googled it. Yeah. I asked the nurses, you know, if they have any patients with uh, with this Guillain Barre syndrome, yeah. and they're like, "Yeah, it happens maybe once a year." So I said, "Okay, so I'm a rare case," and I was like, "Okay, cool in a way, but mm, also not so cool." Yeah. And uh, but they say, you know, that person, you know, he was okay 
I don't, well, he left walking at least yeah. after those five days. Yeah. And uh, yeah, me was different then because I didn't leave after five days. Yeah. I get into the hospital, I stayed for a longer time. Yeah. And then in the uh, care unit, I asked them too. Yeah. Have you ever had this disease? And they're like, yeah, we had a few. Yeah. So I was, I'm still a rare case. Yeah, yeah. But still, I'm going to beat this. I show them. But they all said, you know, this. they had one that actually was still at that point was sitting in a wheelchair. And I was like, okay, well, why is he still sitting in a wheelchair? You know, he's getting the medicine and everything. Yeah. It cannot be that bad. But I was like, mm, okay, passed. You know, yeah, I didn't yeah. even think of it. Yeah. I was so like, okay, come here. now exactly, I have to beat this. That's yeah. what I was thinking right there. And then when you lay in the hospital, you have nothing else to do than you be on your phone watching videos, motivation. Well, I, I just remember after speaking to you on the phone, and then I, I looked further, of course, what's going on. And I, I watched all the YouTube videos and all the, um, and I did a bunch of reading about it. And I was just like getting like Christopher's to get like his mind right here. He needs to be like screaming, you know, mantras in the night, like mm. my nervous system, make my legs work, you know, every night. And I just remember I, there was one line that came into my body it was a quote from Joe Dispenza. Uh, that line of the body can heal itself by thought alone. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started sending you the, yeah. the, the WhatsApps over the Jonas Spencer exactly. podcasts. And but all exactly. that probably saved a lot of my, my rehab time because also he asks, I think is your mind is your placebo or be in your placebo or something like that. And it's a great video, YouTube video. I also had it in my ears. You, because I, you really, there's nothing to see. So you basically can listen to it. And his voice alone is very healing, healing in a way. Exactly. And he was like, feel your, you see your whole body. You basically you feel your feet, feel your legs. And even though I couldn't really feel my legs, but my mind were feeling my feet, was feeling my hands, feeling my back. Feeling, I think, my temples and eyes and everything, you know, he goes through your whole body. And you lay there and you feel really in a trance, so to say. You lay there, you close your eyes, you're trying to sleep normally. And just to his voice and everything. And even though I could not feel my body, my mind felt my body, you know. Yeah. So I do think uh, Dr. Joe Desperanza helped a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But otherwise, you lay there and you watch... Yeah. motivation videos well that's your choice isn't it you can sit there as the victim and say i've got this thing and it's terrible and it's awful and i don't know the future or you can take action and i think that's in everything in life if you're in a desperate or difficult situation that's out of your control the only one thing you control you can control is your mm -hmm. mind your decision to what you think about and how you're going to approach it yeah. Yeah. i remember then calling our good mutual friend will yeah will yeah and uh i said to him I said to him, have you heard about what's going on with Chris? He was like, no, no, what's happening? And uh, I told him the story a bit and I said, man, we, we, you know, in all the times Christopher's been there for us and we can count on him and we know we can call on him. I said, we, we need to go there. And again, then I called Casey and I knew she said you're in ICU and I, and she was like, yeah, you know what? Like they're not letting people in, but you could try. I'm sure Christopher would appreciate exactly. it. the intensive care unit. You have to be family or something like yeah. that. Otherwise, you can't really get in there. Yeah. So I just I I got on the phone. I, that was the go ahead for us. I was like, mate, we got the green light. Case said we can try. Like we can try. And, you know, it's a green light. It's a quite a drive. You know, I and I said to Will, we'll meet up somewhere. So I we headed out early, early morning. Hit the road. You know, met at a at a lay by car park. He jumped in my car. We came further you know, didn't know where we were going, found the hospital, couldn't find a car park, parked illegally somewhere. You know, I remember running into the hospital and he's like, so what's the game plan? There is no plan. <laughs> I was like, just, we'll just walk in and just see, get some bearings on where he could be. Like, and of course it's in German. Will lives in Germany, but he's, you know, he's, he's an that. Aussie. He doesn't know any German, <laughs> let alone read it. No. And so we, we get in the hospital and then I was like, here, look, sign here, I see you. And then there's a door and then this doctor comes in. It was like, do we, should we grab a white coat and a clipboard or something? It's like, mm, just walk, man, like you, you know, know what you're doing. Owning. 
so we're just you know in the whole way on the car we're reminiscing about you know the, the times we've had together and um you know then also what if they don't let us in and there was no question we were seeing it it didn't matter you know they'd have to have armed guards on the gate we weren't going to get in there and then this opportunity came where this doctor um walked in and he had the code and the stethoscope and he was looking at his clipboard and he looked up and i just remember this quote from uh from a comedian that said if you're not meant to be somewhere just look someone in the eye and give them the feeling that you should <laughs> and I, it just came through my mind i looked at this doctor and he's looking at his clipboard and he looked up and i said hey morning how are you he said yeah i'm good oh yeah and uh and we fought the door. He scanned the door. The door opened. We followed him in. We walked with him. And I was like, hey, right, I see ya. It was a bit like, okay, just went along with it. And then we we're walking through. And Will's like, how do we find out which room? I said, we just look in every one of them. So we're going along and the nurses are busy. Yeah. And a couple of them glanced. Yeah. But we didn't try to avoid them. I said good morning in my best German. Best German. And then... We were going into rooms, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, yeah, you see it. The, the rooms are fairly small. You see the patient right away. You see away. the patient right away. So it's not like we were going up. No. <coughs> you see, that's not him, you know. No. So yeah. we went in, and of course, then we you were there having a blood clean. So yeah. th probably the worst timing probably of, of ever. And then got in, stood behind your bed, and then you came to. And you, <laughs> I'm out of it. I, open my eyes. And I was like, that cannot be. That cannot be. Hey, you guys are here. <laughs> and then we stood there for a bit, and then you came too. We had a bit, bit of a chat. We have a... You were like, D just... Um, Two-minute chit-chat. Just, uh, just... I think yeah, we had... hide, guys. You'll be well, right. I think one nurse threw you two masks, because in the ICU, you had to add masks. Yeah, no. Well, the, the matron at the yeah. Elga's House of Pain, she arrived. And yeah. And she, I mean, she gave it to us. Yep. Like, serious. And so she should. I mean, this is ICU. People have, you know... Yeah, there are... And, and this is not that far out of corona time no no exactly that so, some corona rules yeah still in the hospital it was pretty irresponsible really when i think back but we uh you did see me <laughs> we did see you so for a short period for a time. short period yeah that's right and then we were we we of course she sent us out of course and then we were thinking do we do we you know should we make another attempt <laughs> and we'll start and, we, and wells and i she was pretty serious like i don't think we should have another go <laughs> so yeah, but we did get to see her. Yeah, we did. did uh, you did see me for like two minutes. Yeah, we did like that did before she came in and checked on the machine. <laughs> yeah, basically gave it away. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so you've gone from some pretty serious treatment with already the blood washes and the blood washes good. were hard because you felt so weak afterwards. I'm not going to call it. It's probably nothing like chemo or something like that. But you do feel something happened to your body. You've been the whole every drip of blood in your system and gone through a machine yeah and that's how it felt like you felt weak and you have nothing more to give you basically just want to sleep yeah and that's what it yeah you lay there for like hours too because the blood wash alone took two hours and then get the blood back another half an hour if the machine was playing along because the machine always every time i like moved a little bit the machines had a fit and then the nurse had to come in and push some buttons on it and yeah, yeah. So it took forever sometimes. Um, so how long was that period in the blood wash tool? I had for the seven. Yeah, it was once a day. Once a day? Once a day, they did it for seven days. Yeah, right. So, um, and then I normally, I did listen to uh, normally Dr. Joe Desperanza when I was doing the blood wash, because as I said, his voice felt so healing. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he had some other videos I listened to, and then I had motivation videos, speeches, <sighs> Arnold Schwarzenegger, six rules of success, <laughs> stuff like that. You know, it just feeding yourself. Exactly. I probably fell asleep to most of it, but my brain still hurt it in a way. And yeah. I was like, okay, I fell asleep to Arnold last night. Oh, I have to yeah. push Arnold again. And he listened to Arnold and other motivation. So you video. still felt you were in some way building, growing. Yeah, yeah I was going to take sure. this opportunity. I was, to... <laughs> I was in the hospital. I love watching YouTube anyway. Yeah. But now I'm in the hospital. I mean, you can only watch so much youtube netflix or whatever yeah and when you're in the hospital you're like okay i can't watch anymore yeah i was like fulfilled i i i, 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 I really i filled my limit uh, yeah but still it was this motivation and stuff like that it, i loved it yeah quotes loved it yeah. motivation quotes david goggins you send me yeah. links to him too because david goggins is uh 
fantastic. I'm not going to call him crazy because he doesn't want to be called crazy, but he's just a little bit extreme. Yeah. Well, he's one of those that had to do Navy SEALs twice the hell week. He was the only one that been actually, he had 21 stress yeah. fractures and still kept He's a good motivator to, to realize where your limits, exactly. where you think your limits should are and where they actually can exactly. be. Yeah. When it sucks, he has to suck because yeah. otherwise you, you can't do it. You shouldn't do it. Yeah. And that's why I felt too, you know, I think, okay, my life sucks a little bit right now. That's good. Now I just keep on fighting. Keep yeah. on going. Keep yeah. on fighting because this is good. It yeah. should it should feel this way. Correct. Yeah. And then you just keep on fighting. And yeah. I remember too when I was done with all these blood washes and they're like, okay, now we're gonna start to um, rehab you. I was like, okay, great. I can't even I can't even lift. I can't even sit up in bed by this point. And uh, and that was so so first rehab first. You have a little bit in the hospital. You know yeah. they, they have some people coming and trying to move you a little bit to see how bad you are basically. Mm-hmm. And um, they um, they did okay job and um, trying to get me sit on my edge of, uh, edge, edge of the bed and um, trying to stand up. But you know it's. It's one thing to stand up alone, but it's one thing if you have two people holding you, basically yeah. you're not really standing up there. It's your legs are not there. You basically lock your knees in a way. It's a, yeah. it looks totally weird, but anything like a tripod. Yeah. It's a little bit like that. Yeah. They're like, and then it holds you on. So what was the first session? Tell me about the first, like, what's the first thing I remember you telling me laying in the bed and they said, move your foot. Yeah, yeah your... exactly. They see if the feeling is coming back. So they say, mm-hmm. can you wiggle your toes? And then, as I said, you know, in your, my mind, I can wiggle my toes, but then nothing is really coming. Like, I feel like, well, I'm, so really, I'm moving my whole thing. Really I'm really, f- I'm moving my foot. That's what I'm thinking. And the doctors are like looking underneath the blanket and be like, okay, looking good. Maybe <laughs> tomorrow we can do more. And that's like, still not where it should be. You know, it's not like they, okay, you moved your whole foot. They didn't not to say, they say like, Okay, we can see you can move your toes a little bit, but it's, and they not want to give me false hope, but they're like, okay, you will come, give it time. Don't stress yourself out. And yeah. I was like, okay, now I am a little bit worried myself, but I was like, I can, I can beat this, you know, I'll, yeah. I'll show them tomorrow. Yeah. So, you know, I lay there in bed, someone motivation voice in my head. It's like, you can do it. The world is not full of rainbows and sunshine. Yeah. You know, if you see that Rocky movies, there's always some motivation in them too. Yeah. It's always something happened. Yeah. You have to watch those, I think at Google or putting you to motivation movie speeches and stuff like that. And there's some great coaches in Remember the Titans from Denzel Washington yeah. or something yeah. like that. There's always someone that has it's a good a, quote yeah. or saying. And when someone overcomes something, it's normally due to some sort of adversity and they have to go through the struggle in order to Exactly. Yeah, Someone had to struggle too. So that's yeah. what I normally had. Like a Rocky movie, he struggled too. He got beaten up and all that. So Did they like, coach you through that? Like standing, looking at the foot and your brain saying move and then you... You see, I see, I see my feet. Yeah. And I'm in my head, I'm just like, I'm really moving my toes, but really nothing is coming. And that's a little bit frustrating, but I was like... Mm. And then are they saying like, just imagine it's moving or no, that came, you make that, that came first came later. That came later in my rehab here in uh, Langford. Mm-hmm. Because I got then, I was done with everything in the hospital and they sent me out to... Um, and it's a hospital, of course. It's a hospital. It's not a rehab. They, exactly. It's not a rehab center. And they said, okay, we can only do so much for you. Now it's time to really go in a rehab center. Yeah. And uh, they want to send me somewhere else, but I was like, again, worst business, you know, some people, and, uh, we have a very good, uh, facility here and 15 minutes away from home, instead of being like two hours away, yeah. like it's easy for my wife, she can come visit me and I kind of know the people who runs it. Yeah. So it was easy going. So I, well, I had some good friends, made some phone calls, get some set up. And, um, so I got sent home over a short period of, of a weekend. Mm-hmm. And then I started there on a Monday, get picked up from, uh, you know, a normal transport, like an ambulance basically, but it's not really an ambulance, but, uh, it's like, what do you call it? Transport for sick people, basically, yeah. you know, you have to do everything 
with the book and insurance yeah. style. And I got sent there. At this point, you know, I'm, I lost 15 kilo of muscle, basically. I'm just a skeleton. I lo- I, seriously, my, I've never had so thin arms and so thin <laughs> legs. And uh, I got carried in or with um, into my in a bed, and they like laid me down like a I'm not gonna call it like a person. I was like a, a paralyzed person. I could not move my arms. I could not move my legs, and I'm like down to around seventy kilo, which I like I probably I weighed that in high school. That's <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was like seventy. I was like can you even imagine it? Yeah. But uh, yeah, that's how I started, and that's um, my rehab center in uh, Langford and it's called yeah. Neurologia Factor. Yeah. And so the physio process, I remember getting some videos. Tell me about the machines because there was some remarkable. They had some great machines. That was also one of the reasons I was very happy it was so close because they had, in my opinion, for what I needed, one of the best machines. Instead of you getting a, a ball you have to squeeze in your hand, yeah. I got hooked up to a machine that basically I can stretch and let go with my hand. So I get my mobility in my hand back. Yeah. And um, so that felt great. And then I remember seeing, was that the one where you you could move all the little... Exactly, uh, you got... And then you have a computer screen? Exactly, computer screen. And I can like, we play games normally. I like shooting arm brust, you know. I remember sending you a cheesy message like, Oh, uh, good one, mate. Sitting there playing computer games, get out and muck in the stables. Exactly. <laughs> and that was like great because games, I love playing yeah. games. And, yeah. and that yeah. stimulation exactly. between mind and brain. Yeah. Because I like, I want 100%. You know, you can't miss one of those errors because yeah. then you get 99 or 98. Yeah. So I was like, 100. You can gauge your progression. 100. Exactly. So I yeah. played that game a lot. Yeah. Right hand, left hand. We a different game. You could play a fire game. And something with the uh, elevator go up and down to pass. You can squeeze, you can shoot, and uh, you can do a lot with your hand. And that yeah. really increased my mobility in my hand. Instead of you going somewhere else where you don't have those machines, you get yeah. a, a ball in your hand and they yeah. say, squeeze that 20 times. Yeah. And uh, here I got hooked up and I did something else. Yeah. For my body and for my brain, it was really challenging doing something. Yeah. And, um, and then there was uh, another machine is called the, the geo machine it's probably ha- called something else in the whole full name but there was geo and there you get hooked up in a harness so to say and it teaches you how to walk my brain knows how to walk but my body is not responding so you get hooked up in a harness you hang there your feet get hooked up and it basically moves you how you should move like, like an electrical like- trainer or like a yeah, it's it's perfect. You hang there and you basically on and it walks for you. Yeah. And then you just have to follow it. And if you don't follow it, you hang up like a rag doll. But then you figure out, this is how you walk. Yeah. Because in your head, you're like, I know how to walk. But then when you actually have to walk, your body is like telling you something totally different. Or at least in my mind, I know how to walk, but my body is not responding. So I had to learn, relearn how to walk. Yeah. And as a, you see kids, you know, when they walk, you know, they go a couple of steps, they fall and yeah. all that. But when you're older, you don't want to fall. Yeah. And you're a few more kilos. Exactly. Yeah. And so that's why it felt really safe mm-hmm. because you're hanging up to, you can't really fall because yeah. then you just hang in the harness. Yeah. And they first, it first starts to exactly. give you the motion yeah. of they all give you the sensation. How you should move and exactly yeah. the sensation how to move. And yeah. so that felt good. I, we did that every day, had... A great doctor that gives all this uh, recept up, and so I can do this therapy I needed. Yeah, and uh, they took super good care of me at this uh, center. I had that, and there's also um, probably send you that video too when you walk with this uh, skeleton where you're like, like Robocop. Yeah, exactly, with yeah. Robocop, and that's also a great thing to teach you how to walk again because yeah. it's like a skeleton walking, and it's a person behind you mm-hmm. and walking and. Uh, it just shows you, she's basically holding my balance a little bit behind, and yeah. uh, she let me walk. And the skeletons, they walk, I have they follow it. Yeah. You can put it then on me walking. So they basically the robot is helping me when I can't fulfill the step. Yeah. The robot helped to do it. Yeah. But it was great, great equipment. Yeah. And uh, I'm so lucky. What, what does that do for your mindset then? If you, do you get like this big 
because I remember getting the text from you and you were like, I was like, how are you doing, mate? You're like, yeah, I'm doing fine. It's pretty fun here. Like, now that, so me, I was like, <clears throat> I have to get over this. Yeah. I mean, I, I never felt sorry for myself. I'm not one of those who lay in my bed and it's like, why did this happen to me? Yeah. Because I did learn a lot. You know, I did learn how precious life is, how fast life is over. And all with the other people at the center too, you know, it was not just me, there was car accidents, stroke people, yeah. all that. You see a lot of bad things that happens to people. And it's not just, as I said, it's not, life is not just sunshine and rainbows. There is different things out there. And, uh, when one people, one person get hurt, it affects so much more than one person. Like for instance, with me, it does not just, it was not just me being sick. That was my friends being sick. You were sick with me. My wife was sick. Right. Everyone has to take care of with this person. You know, my wife probably got a million phone calls. You know, how is it doing? What is yeah. going on? Yeah. And, uh, I saw it too, you know, with the car accident people, you know, he's in a vegetable mode in a way, but still there fighting himself back in to life and then you yeah. see also the parents for a car accident victim you know it's not sometimes not even their fault you know they get hit by a bigger truck or a, a lorry or something mm. sometimes you know people are just in the wrong place at the wrong time and then you see those people fighting themselves and uh, that is not just them fighting it's husbands wives yeah. kids everyone there, you know, their life is also a little bit on pause, you know, are this person going to make it? Is it even going to be okay one day or are they paralyzed? What do we have to change? Do we have to move? There's so many more life questions. Yeah. Are you empowered then in, in a rehabilitation center like that, that there are more people fighting for their lives and, and also that you have that kind of technology that, that you're like, I've got this amazing machine and there's other people fighting here too, and I'm going to fight harder than I was, yeah, I was going to fight harder than anyone. You know, I was like working out in my own room, what I could do. You know, they said that this is exercise that you can do when you're alone, trying to lift your legs, trying to move this, trying to sit up in bed. And I was like, you know, try and sit up in bed. You know, it's, it's very difficult when you have paralyzed, you know, but yeah. stuff like that, you just have to practice. You have to practice, practice, practice. And because you only get so much time with the therapist, you know, they take for sure a time with you, mm. but you know, it's you, up to you how bad you want it Yeah. because they're there to help you and to show you a path, but then it's up to you to take it. So every time I have, you know, for sure you have to rest a little bit too, because yeah. they told me in the beginning, Christopher, I know you really want this bad, but you cannot overdo it because if your muscles get tired, then you get like fatigue. Yeah. And that's what we don't need now. So we can only push you so much. Yeah. And then you have to go slow a little bit. I know you really want to get back on your feet, but we cannot do much. Yeah. So you're sitting in your wheelchair and that's like, I got very good at riding my wheelchair, but I knew exactly what they said. We did a lot of videos to film everything. Yeah. And I remember the first video uh, when I saw myself sitting in a wheelchair and trying to figure out how it was, I was like, okay, this is not me. I have to fuck myself back because how am I going to run a stable sitting in a wheelchair? That was one of my first things. Yeah. Because people ask me, what's your plan B? I said, I don't have plan B. I, there is no plan B. I have to get better so I can get back in the stable, working, running the business, starting my young horses, riding horses. I think that's such an important thing. I speak about that also myself in all other areas. I mentioned it on a few other podcasts I'd done with other people about the plan B. Like if you have a plan B, you can't, you can't put all of yourself into the plan A. No. You know, you can better go full throttle in plan A. And if that fails, make another plan A. Yeah. Don't try to spread yourself over a plan B. No. But I was like, what my plan B, what am I going to do? Sit in an office where I'd be miserable the rest yeah. of my life? Yeah. Mm. So... And so how do you go with that sort of rhythm in, in rehab where, um, you know, like you say, you're going to look after the, the muscles and recovery time and things, good days and bad days, like they're obvious. And how does, how do you 
what is the mindset? How do you deal with that? What is a good day and a bad day when you're when you're in the rehab? There were good days, bad days. I had when I was in the hospital. Those were my bad days. When you feel like here in the rehab center now, I'm feeling like I'm taken care of. I'm. They know what they're doing. I felt they're professional. They know exactly what they're doing. They give me the equipment I need. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, now we're getting better. Because when you're laying in a hospital bed, paralyzed, can't do anything, you can't even drink. You have to ask someone to help you drink. You have to ask someone to do put a blanket over you because you can't do anything. Yeah. That's a bad day. Does it give you a different perspective of what? What a good day and bad day. I what a bad have, day is? I don't have bad days anymore. That's yeah. for sure. Yeah. Bad day. I had when I wasn't really sick. That's a bad day. Today, when you get, when you wake up and you can't walk. Exactly, something like the easiest thing for us. That is so natural to just put your feet on the ground and walk. That's something that's so natural for us. But when you can't do that, something so basic is taken care of, taken away from you. Then you know, like, okay, that's a bad day. Yeah. So today, I have long days. I had maybe days a little bit harder, but I don't have bad days. I don't have bad days anymore. And I was very happy to say that Yeah. because there's always someone, also something I think of on my worst day or on a bad day, for instance, if I can walk in my stable here and I have to say, okay, it's a long day, it's hard work. There's someone out in this world that would do anything to have my bad day. Okay. To just switch his life to have that day. And that's what I thought too when I lay in the hospital bed and sometimes the nurses came in and it's like, oh, a bad day, it overslept. Something is closed and I didn't do that. And I was like, you having a bad day? I having a bad day. Yeah. You just have maybe a little bit rough day. It's not bad. I would do anything to have your life right now. Just be able to walk. Yeah. When you lay there, you can't even walk. You can't even do anything. You can't even eat this pudding they give you. You can't even eat that. Yeah. You can't even drink a tea on your own. Yeah. That's a bad day. Yeah. yeah. So today, I don't have bad days. Yeah. And that's also great to live like that because I don't have bad days. Yeah. Gives you perspective on, on what you have and you can be grateful. Like you're saying, that you, when you're in that position and all the normal things that you take for granted are taken away. Yeah. And then you sit here in your stable with... Yeah, exactly. Enjoy it. And, and be working outside and... Yeah. yeah, there's always... Uh, and that's why I say also, it's the small things in life yeah. that matters. You know, I was sitting there in the Rio Center with a good friend of mine. And uh, we're sitting there both in our wheelchairs because none of us could walk at that point. We're watching these birds making a nest. It was like, must have been March, April. Now, April it must have been. The pigeon is screwing around with uh, some smaller birds and... The smaller birds, you know, they were like half the size, not even and chasing this pigeon away. And we're like sitting there in the spring sun watching this pigeon and these small birds are they fighting and building nests and all that. And like it was like cartoon with kids, you know. Like you know, I remember as a kid, you know, you can watch a cartoon and you were like really in it. And there we were sitting there, two grown men in their wheelchairs in the spring sun watching birds in the trees. And that's how we spend our days. And cool. like, then you see like, and sometimes I just told my friend, Andre is his name. Andre, did you see that? Isn't it amazing? Yeah. He said, it's so beautiful. And you see, and that's what I mean with the small things in life that yeah. you forget to walk by. You, you didn't, if I wouldn't have this disease or if it wouldn't happen to me, something like that, I would just basically walk by. I wouldn't even knowledge there was a bird there or something like that you just basically walk by and be like oh stupid pigeon yeah today i'll be like oh look at that yeah. beautiful bird flying around yes yeah. it may be a little bit messy sometimes and all that but yeah beautiful you sit there and watch all these small things that you walk by yeah and then you see it and that's that's nice it changes yeah and it's amazing that's what i said in the beginning of the podcast that it's <clears throat> it's crazy that it sometimes takes some kind of threat on our mortality or something drastic terrible to happen before we noticed the beautiful things that are around us mm. every day yeah you know to have that moment 
like you say, sitting with another guy in a wheelchair, looking, watching some pigeons build a nest and think and seeing the beauty in that. Yeah. Where, in, when in life would we normally have had time? No, no, I say, I say the time. And it's sure. always there. It's, always, it's, it's a choice whether we get to notice it or not. Yeah. And you sit there and the trees go green. I was lucky to be in the springtime, I guess, because you see everything come, coming back to life. Yeah. And that basically gave me also a little bit of fuel to like, yeah. oh yeah, nature is coming back and I'm coming back. I'm feeling they yeah. become a little bit stronger. And then when you hear other people, I remember too, you know, we asked the doctors and stuff like that and, you know, what's my chances are. And it's like, it's all individual. I can't really give you anything, but most people do get healed. Some people, you know, yeah. not hundred percent. Yeah. And I was just thinking in my head, you don't know me. You don't know me. I'm going to get 110%. God, that was, yeah, you yeah. don't know me, son. You don't know me, son. <laughs> Who's going to carry those boats? <laughs> That's a, that was in my head. I was like, because they were yeah. about that same time, you know, watching all this motivation and it was just really boiling up in me. And they're like, you have no clue who I am. I'm going to show them all. I'm not going to get 100%. I'm going to get 110, 120%. I'm going to be better than ever yeah. when I come out of here. So that was also a few. <clears throat> when someone said, it's impossible or you can't do it. I was like, I'm possible. I can't do it. No, no, no. I can do it. Yeah. And I was proving my point every day. I was like yeah. working my ass off. Also one of those rules from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. Work your butt off. Try not to, you know, I remember also, you know, people, he talks about this 24 hour rule, you know, the day has 24 hours. You sleep six and you have 18 hours of work out or do something like that. Yeah. And I remember that when he said, yeah, but do you always some people that say, eh, I need seven, eight hours of sleep. And then Arnold says, yeah, for those people, I can only say sleep fast. <laughs> and I was like, I love that because I was like, I had, I slept basically six hours and then yeah. I was doing stuff. I was trying to sit up in bed. I was trying to move my toes. I was trying to move my hands. Yeah. I did everything I could in my power to really use my yeah. days when I was awake. So when the therapist came into my room to get me to drive me to therapy or something like that, or I had to go to therapy, that I was prepared. I already did a little bit before, so I'm not going to come there cold yeah. and waste my time with the therapist of yeah. warming up for 15 minutes before the session is over. So I was always warmed up in a way. Yeah. So I did watch a lot of... Yeah, motivation. <laughs> and what about milestones? Were there some major milestones through the recovery process that gave you momentum or, you know, kicked you on to the next level or? Oh, for sure. I remember the first day standing up against a wall or something like that, holding on to something. And they have this, how you starting to walk, you know, this wheel, you a chair basically higher up. So you hold on. And you lay your whole underarm on a platform, so to say, and then you can stand up and lean on this thing and try to figure out how to move with your legs. When you did that for the first time, I remember I made on four meters, two meters, and then we turn around two meters back. And I was like, I was actually walking. I was exhausted, sweating like crazy, probably also from anxiety I was probably scared like yeah. oh my god if I'm gonna make it back to my wheelchair or not yeah and the therapist you know they for sure they were helping was a big guy it was really strong yeah I felt really safe with him behind yeah. me because he's like two meters something yeah and he could probably grab me with a one arm and yeah. the wheelchair with the other if, yeah. if it would go south on yeah. me but that was the first day and I was like I was actually walking yeah and that was that was a milestone I was like okay it's coming back yeah we can do this and do you think the elements of that were because you'd envisioned it and you were working towards it and you were telling yourself you were going to walk again and then you actually start the four steps or that it was something so physically demanding of your body and you push through it and you or, or all of those I things? I think it's in your mind. If, yeah. you're, if you can do it in your head, I think it's possible to do. And then it comes to fruition. Because, yeah, for sure. My body is prepared mentally. Yeah. And then it just has to prepare now to how much muscle do I need? Yeah. Because my legs are still very skinny at this point, you know, yeah. for sure we're working out, but it's not going to end that fast. Yeah. So what I felt is my body is trying to do what the mind is telling you. 
Yeah. Like how much, and also there's the damage from the, the disease I had, you know, my nerves are still damaged. This uh, is sending a signal how to stand up, but the muscles don't get the right information. How much yeah. muscle do we need to send to the legs to make this body to stand up? Yeah. So that's also, everything is like screwed up a little bit. Yeah. So that's also the next sitting in a wheelchair to stand up. It's a scary thing to do because your legs are like wet noodles. Yeah. Yeah. It basically, you stand up and it just collapse under you. Yeah. And to figure that out and you have to have your set, your mindset has to be also nothing's going to happen. We're going to be fine. That's yeah. a scary part because the next part is the brain is there to protect us. Yeah. So every time you do something new or standing up, if you hesitate, the brain is like, uh oh, Christopher's hesitating. Something's going on. Oh shit. Are we going to try to stand up? Oh no, that's a bad idea because we don't know how that's pretty good and protect. Exactly. Yeah. So there you have to overwin too. And of course me, I'm already seeing videos on YouTube for <laughs> motivation. This great video with, I think it's Mel Robbins mm -hmm. to count down from five, four, three, two, one, stand up. Yeah. It's like a, it's a little bit of a reboot yeah. for your brain. It's like, yeah. It's, it's like, oh, what the hell's going on? And then like, okay, we're standing up. Yeah. Instead of like protecting, you, you basically, you fool the brain a little bit. Yeah. Prepare. And that helps. Exactly. That helped me a lot. Every yeah. time you did something new, you basically, in your head, you're like, three, two, one. Okay, let's yeah. go. Yeah. And uh, took away a lot of yeah. brain problem for me. It's funny. I don't know where I heard. I heard a similar thing. But I do that before I come out to a live event. I think I learned it from a Tony Robbins uh, yeah. seminar or something. But it's absolutely that. It's like preparing your body, getting your mind ready, yeah. building it up, and now's the moment. It's yeah. like boom, boom, there it happens. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. it felt amazing, and it worked for me every time. Yeah, every time I was like, "Oh shit, are we gonna have to do that?" You thought about it, and then you, in your head, you're like, "Forget those things." Yeah, and then, like you count down. Yeah, and then you just did it, and. Uh, yeah. I think that shortened my whole time a lot. Yeah. Because otherwise people are saying, oh, you're probably going to be here. You're not going to be able to walk until August, September. That's what they told yeah. me. You know, some people, you always listen to some people. You'd be like, yes, yeah. So mm -hmm. Exactly. But you, every time, you know, some person said, you know, be lucky if you should walk here or not, all that. And you're like, you don't know me. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to walk out of here. I'll set this, you know, I'm going to yeah. be walking faster than anyone else. And I just had a great mindset. I got it out. I just, yeah. with everything I've done and everything I've seen. And as I love quotes, you know, I think there's a quote from Bob Marley too. You don't know how strong you are until strong is the only thing you can do. Yeah. Or something like that would be. Yeah. And that also seemed to like, I watched a lot of videos. And I read a lot of quotes just being stronger in my mind. And yeah. Just, Stuff like that, and that yeah. just helped me too. And I remember you sent me um, a clip personally, but you also shared it on on Instagram, social media, and that was the first time you got back on a horse. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. as part of your rehab, I guess. Yeah, they told me so, that was actually a good idea. That would have been a major milestone, of course. Yeah, getting back to the thing you do, who you are. Yeah, they told right. me to do it um, for my balance and just for to get feelings back. Yeah. And I remember that too, because my hands were like, they were there, but they were still numb in a way. I remember there were dogs in the center too. You can pet a dog. Mm -hmm. And my uh, physiotherapist, she had a dog. And every time I pet it, it was like a cold, hairy animal in a way. I, I didn't have this, it didn't feel good to pet an animal. I was like, that was so weird. I remember that first the time we rode a horse here. Two days after my birthday, it was a weekend, and I asked uh, the lady here who has therapy riding for for uh, handicapped kids and stuff like that, and I asked her, can I please borrow your horse? And she's like, sure, I'll help you, and we set it up. I came with my wheelchair, and there's a whole ramp up, because first thing, how the hell do you get on a horse? Yeah. Because they're not going to give me a leg up, because I can't even stand up. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. But there's a also so way before up. you were able to yeah, walk, you were riding. Yeah, 
exactly. I was still sitting in a wheelchair, and there's a ramp all the way up to the horse. Basically, you the horse is standing next yeah. to you, and I could I can stand up in a way, but I could not walk or anything. But you could stand up, and the horse is right next to me, so to say. And then you basically like, I had to help to lift my leg over, and you sat on the horse. And I remember that day till you is how I pet the horse. You just feel this, the warmth of the animal. And I remember running my hands through the mane of him. And just amazing how it was. And I thought to myself, you know, this is why people love horses. Yeah. Because the coat felt amazing. Because you feel, at this point, you're not starting to feel the heat yeah. in my hands. And just running your fingers through the, the main basic up. elements of your senses exactly the reintroduction yeah. to what it actually felt like maybe the first and time i remember exactly that's what i felt and i remember this was my job yeah and you actually you forgot it because it was just a job you just pet a horse yes we pet a horse but we didn't pet like i'd pet i pet like this horse like oh my god this felt amazing you did this coat of this horse you know and then running your fingers through the mane I was like, you know, I have to do this more often. And that's something I do today. You know, I do run, take my gloves off and yes, run the hands in your fingers through the mane because yeah. it's something that you can't pay. It's yeah. something people take for granted that we sit on horses and we forget these small things. Yeah. To just run your hand, fingers through the mane, it's it's an amazing thing. And we got it. It's a job. Yeah. And I just, that's what I did. I remember that I sat on that horse and that was the first thing I did. And I was like, oh my God. And I also, when I sat on a horse, I felt, okay, this is home. Yeah. When you sit on a horse again, you do feel the heat from the horse. And I was like, okay, this is, this is my seat. Yeah. This is, this is where I belong. Could you smell that? Because of course mm -hmm. we're living with it. Yeah. Every day and someone that doesn't know horses comes in and says, okay, mm, like the oh, smell yeah. of horse. And you're like, what yeah, is that? It's amazing. <laughs> that was, yeah, because yeah. the horse smells horse. Yeah. And, um, it was just, you felt so home. Yeah. Because as a clinic is a clinic, you know, they're, they're, it doesn't smell like we know smell. Yeah, it does smell the hay. You smell yeah, but exactly, straw. you feel this, it's like hay, yeah. no cut gray, you yeah. hay, you know how that smells. Yeah. The horses, you know, smell horse. Yeah. That was just amazing. I remember that too, you're sitting there and like, oh yeah. You smell the, the you smell, you, you sense your life through your smell. Yeah. Through smell. Yeah. No, but it, was, it felt it amazing. Was, felt <laughs> amazing. So going through this process and, and experiencing all these things, what kind of um, relationships do you develop with the your carers, the people in the rehab? And, and, you know, going through this actually life-changing event... How does it change uh, your other relationships with your family, with your wife? Like you were talking about, of course, all the pressure it puts on them all. Mm -hmm. What? How is that affecting the relationships with the, with the people that are caring for you, the bonds you build, the changes maybe with the, your people closest to you? Yeah, it's just, when I got released from my Rhea Center, I remember I put a post on my Instagram too, and I also felt, I almost cry every time I had to say goodbye to my therapist because they also be, it's like family now because you live there day in day out for months there yeah. and um, forever I feel greatness to them you know what yeah. they did to me is just uh, amazing and uh, I'm thankful forever for the rest of my life what they did to me in a very short period of time yeah. of course they say, you know, yeah, but it's your mindset. It, well, you did the work. As of course, I probably did work, but without their help and their push, you know, I would not be able to be walking or moving as fast as I came back. Mm -hmm. And uh, to my wife, of course, you know, she's amazing. What she pulled off here without uh, me being here. Mm -hmm. And of course, we have help in the stable too. Don't get me wrong. There's for sure other people also helping out but there's those people yeah you yeah. know without them it will never worked out like it did he worked out actually well for we had many horses we had the full stable and everything everything was set to be working like a normal spring so to yeah. say and then you know a busy time though busy time you know exactly the young horses coming in you have to be done and mm -hmm. and then everything just gets 
delayed. Yeah. And uh, no, they all did an amazing job. And uh, you feel that too. You you appreciate things in yeah. a different way. Like it's not just oh thank you. It's not enough. You know. Yeah. To those people uh, in the Rea Center, you know, I owe them a lot. Yeah. You know that they believed in me and they pushed me in a way that I remember one of the first steps and I first tried to run a little bit because one therapist asked me, what do you want to do? And I was like, I would love to just be able to run again. You know, those easy, natural thing for a human body to do, just be able to jog, run. And she's like, let's try it. Let's do it. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, but I can hardly walk. And she's like, yeah, just put your mind to it and let's try it. And we ran down the corridor and it, probably not the prettiest thing, but we ran and I was like, okay, you see? They're getting there and it has felt so much stronger and yeah. that they actually just let me do it and you know, okay, what the hell is gonna go wrong? Either I'm gonna fall on my face and I was like, Okay, it was too early, but yeah. it wasn't. It was perfect and have you been able to reflect with Casey? Like to look back and, and like feel that in totally that you've been through something incredible and actually there's not many things now that could get it's, in your way. You know, you're stronger. But I am exactly. I enjoy life in a different way. That's for sure. And I can I can look back at all these photos I have. I have, thank God for phones today because there's a nice camera. You can mm. capture everything. And I have photos from basically day one. And I was like, I'll be back in five days, babe. And don't worry about me. Yeah. You know, I'm getting my medicine, and we should be back to normal. Yeah. And uh, I took it. We basically left it. I'm not going to call it a secret, but you know, it's not too many people that knew that I was sick in the beginning until I had to three, four weeks afterwards. But there was so much going on in our lives, and Casey was doing everything on her own. Yeah. You go to stallion shows here and there alone, and people starting to think, like, where the hell is Christopher? Why is Casey alone? And mm. before people start talking too much, then we just made a a statement, a post on Facebook and Instagram that what was going on and I was going into a real center and that I had this guillain barré syndrome and so people don't have to talk and yeah. um, then it, it's out there. Yeah. So is there any uh, marvelous physical advantages? <laughs> you told me that it was like um, a physical reset. So... Does it mean all your bad habits in riding, you, the stiffness on the right side and all that is, is totally gone and you've got now a chance to build a whole lot of new bad habits? Yeah, no, I have to work on my bad habits. Um, I just see it as an opportunity to basically, I know how to write. That's not the thing. I can. But still, does it feel I, then, do you I have a new write? I do feel like I have to ride again. Mm -hmm. As I said, I can sit on a horse, I can walk through a canter, that's not the thing. But the feeling to get back, it's there, yeah. but it has had to be improved. Yeah. And before I work all my bad habits, because my bad habits I don't really have yet. I'm not holding too much on the right rein. I'm not yeah. sitting crooked or anything like that. Right now I'm very straight in the saddle. Do you remember things that you did in your riding that you were like? No, but oh, exactly. today it feels different. I, yeah. Otherwise I would have been one of those. But persons. do you remember some old things? I can watch. Like, I don't do that anymore. No, That's I can funny. watch them. Exactly. I can watch some <laughs> videos and be like. See, well, I was even sitting with my left elbow a little bit further back, and today I don't do that. And I can I try not to fall. Do you have a different style? You think you would develop a different style as a rider? Than... Hopefully, you know. Hopefully, I just forget my bad habits a little bit, yeah. you know, because it's riding. It's like I'm not going to call it riding a bike. You know, I can ride a bike, but now I just have to improve riding a bike. And yeah. That's how it feels right now. Yeah, it feels really good, and in a way, I hope I don't have to develop any bad skills or bad habits anytime soon, you know, it'll probably come along the way anyway. Yeah. But right now it feels amazing to just basically sitting there and I feel great riding a horse again. And uh, not that it didn't feel good before, but today I feel like, okay, it feels good. I'm having good connection in both reins, not more one and the other. Now sitting in the middle, stirrup feels good. Do you, do you think now you you've developed a finer, like you're more aware of a finer feeling? I have a, except because my body, as I said, I have to relearn everything. You know, I have to relearn my hands are there again. And I do think I have a finer feeling. Yes, I, I the feel is different. I, it's more sincere, you know, I feel more. 
instead of just it was a job, you know, you rode and that was yeah. it. Today I feel a lot more. Yeah. I feel every more small details. That's what I feel. I you know every time I sit on a horse, you feel a little bit more than I would just. Okay, did he just move funny there? And you feel a lot more, and that yeah. feels great. Yeah. Also in my hands, just the contact, and as I said, you know, you pet the horse, you run your fingers through the mane, it feels amazing. Yeah. And the stuff like that, and then just every everything I do feels amazing, right? So quite a remarkable thing actually to now be because you're back in your in life. My, yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah. Stables riding. You've just taken some more young horses to start. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Filled some boxes. I had a good client and she wrote me and when I was in the Kia Center, I was like, mm -hmm. the boys have their bags packed and ready to <laughs> roll. <go. laughs> no, it's and getting it's, the end of spring. Exactly. <laughs> just let me know when you're feeling, yeah, yeah. you know, strong enough to take him. Right. And I was like, okay, give me to, you know, I had a, a month after my release and they just basically showed up, so I feel I can do it, and um, it feels good. Yeah. I can start a young horse again. So, so after this life struggle is basically bestowed on you, and you you fight it, you beat it. You essentially heal yourself, of course, with the help of your your carers and the rehab and everything. Other things that you totally that are totally different, a different perspective you have on life that that you didn't have before are there things that you just approach completely differently in the, in the before tbs and are there things you do differently now like on a daily basis that you didn't do before like i know you talked about the hands through the main and but is it overall in in the big picture when you think about life in general like the rhythms that we carry and 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 the goals that we think we should set, or you know, is it is a total different perspective for you? I gotta say the stress is a little bit gone. I gotta say I, I work. Yeah, you get everything done still, but I don't have this stress. I had to be done by four o'clock or anything like that. It's not like it takes me longer, but I don't have this stress. And uh, a lot of people work for money. And money is also something that, yeah, it's, it's good to have money, but money is not everything. I lay there in the hospital bed and I thought to myself, I could have had millions in a bank account and I still wouldn't. You can't buy help. No. It wouldn't cure me because the disease is not something you can use. Here, here's a million bucks. Yeah, fix it. Fix it. Yeah. I had, it didn't matter how rich I was. I was still not. And when you lay in the hospital, it doesn't matter. You're rich or poor. You're still the same person and that's something that I figured out too that money is not everything time is more important and uh, relationships to friends family and everything and that's more important than uh, money ever will yeah because uh, money is there sure it helps to have money but it's for sure not everything and that's something that I I felt too that I'm not gonna say I didn't know it before but when you have the opportunity to like if i would have had a million bucks and please cure me and it didn't help then you realize too that okay money is not everything yeah what is the value of money compared with your health exactly yeah. health is the most valuable thing we have and if you don't have that there's really nothing else because if you're not if you don't feel good if you're not healthy it's hard to live a life yeah that makes it like for me if I can't even walk or can't even do what I want to do yeah. then it doesn't matter how yeah. how much money I would have yeah it's interesting you say also about time because I've sort of shifted my relationship with time a lot often when something tragic happens mm. actually to be honest when I've uh, experienced my close friend you going through that it made me reflect on so many things during the day. You know, when I spoke to you and you were telling me about seeing and witnessing other people in the hospital having a bad day, and you said to me, Tristan, don't think you're having a bad day, mate, because that's, yeah, you know. And and sometimes you get into that rhythm of chasing things and being better, and 
building the business and, you know, building a property and becoming more successful and creating more revenue. And that creates a different relationship with time. You're trying to get a million things done in the day. Yeah. And just stopping and reflecting and thinking about the things we were talking about, you know, as you were going through this process, it stopped time for me. I had a different relationship with time. I was stopping and thinking, yeah, what is Christopher going? His daily routine is getting up and trying to do what I've just done while I'm half asleep and waking up and trying to get started in the morning. Um, so it's, yeah, that relationship to time is a, it's a really, and again, it's one of those things that you have a choice yeah. all of the time to have that. Yeah, you can you know, spend those minutes and seconds how you want to do because you get them every day. Yeah. Those seconds, and then it's up to you if yeah. what you want to do with them. If you want to waste them, just sleeping, sitting around, that's up to you. you I like, I want to spend mine. And I was like, I, that's also something when you're 90 years old, you've been sleeping for 30 years. Of course we need sleep, huh? <laughs> yeah. But I was like, I'm going to try to get mine down to like at least 25 years or something like that. Yeah. I want live to use, more. Exactly. I want to live more and use my seconds more. Yeah. And that's something I do. I'm not a morning person, but when I get out of bed, you know, it does feel amazing. Yeah. Watching the sun comes up. A sunrise, it's one of the best things ever you can watch. Yeah. How the life is coming back, you know, from the the darkness, so to say, from the yeah. night, you know, how birds start singing in the morning and the first sun comes over the horizon. It's amazing. And that's something like, for instance, oh, I hated that early show mornings, you know, you had to get up before, like, you know, four o'clock in the morning when everyone else is sleeping and you'd be thinking like, why the hell am I doing this? You know, am I stupid? <laughs> and now you're thinking everyone's missing this. And and exactly. Yeah, but exactly. That's what you do. You walk in and you see like all these amazing things that people like just miss. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, I was out partying last night and now I'm feeling bad and all that. Yeah. So, no. Why? Yeah. You see what this nature and world is showing up yeah. for free. And so take those free seconds every time you can and just spend them well. Well, it's also today, like I feel a totally different energy than what we normally would have. Yeah. When I arrived today, I thought, Christopher's just got some Australian jeans put into it. Yeah. It's like rolled out. And of course, normally when I come here, we're doing horses or, you know, we've got a schedule and, you know, we've got to get as many things done because, it, you know, it's we're together time, yeah. We're together for a short time. So we try to get lots of horses worked and mm -hmm. try to feel productive. And today we actually started by... But we're still very productive, but, yeah, yeah. but, but we're, yeah, we got actually, a lot. We got a lot done. Yeah, but uh, but there wasn't that depression. No, exactly. Yeah. There was a whole different and approach to it. Yeah, it and was that's... almost like there was time to choose what we wanted to do. Yeah, exactly. We couldn't even done more, but it felt like we didn't. It felt like we didn't do anything, but yeah. we did a lot. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Jump in the two horse truck and test yeah we, we test that. that exactly but that's something like you never would have done either when we looked at <laughs> I it don't know it's time for that yeah, yeah. exactly and today we're like take yeah. five minutes come on let's, let's do it. it yeah exactly we're done exactly we need to do it more yeah exactly we spend those seconds we get for free every every day so you know you've made this miraculous recovery and you mentioned to me the inventor of the robot machine contacted you because you wanted to document your story you Basically, you're the reason that he made the machine. All the nurses and the people responsible in helping you in your rehab, calling you Superman. Um, of course, you wore your Superman T-shirt yeah. pretty much uh, every day in between Casey washing it. And of course, which you wore regularly before this happened. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I was always a Superman, even <laughs> as a little kid. But Because uh, I just felt also in the rehab center, the reason I wore it, is because he felt that I gave me a little bit extra power. And also running, or sitting in a wheelchair, going down the hallway in a rehab center, when people watch you, you're sitting in a wheelchair and you have a Superman shirt on, they put a smile to their faces because everyone knew what that symbol meant. You know, it's a symbol for hope. If you're a comic person, you know what that means, hope. Yeah. And yeah. it's just not Superman, it's the symbol of hope. And uh, to have that on your shirt going down and you see all the people, it didn't matter how 
badly injured they are. Yes, gave you that look. And they put a smile on their face. And you're like, see what? I just let people smile. You know, yes, they see that symbol. I felt, it felt great for me. And it gave me that extra fuel yeah. to get through the day too. Because yes, because I had a big Superman shirt on. Yeah. So I wore it a lot. And you've, you've actually now got the official badge. Yeah, that's it. Let's take a look at the... You uh, want to see my... I want to see. <laughs> it's funny because I haven't seen it yet. I've been here the whole day. There it is. <laughs> so now you officially... Uh, now I officially got branded. my hope symbol on my shoulder. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, feel, it was something I had to do. I always wanted a tattoo, but I didn't know where and I didn't know what. And here I was just... Life is too short to just sit what if... So yes, do it. Yeah, you, you had, had a pretty good symbol that means. And it means a lot to me. Exactly, it means yeah. a lot to me and uh, help me fight through a lot of um, yeah difficult struggles. So it actually probably, when you talk about that mentally, gave you a superpower. Yeah, God knows, maybe it did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it, it felt, as I said, something I had to do, and yeah. now I have it, and yeah. now it's always with me. So it's it's. An incredible thing if you think about, you know, the time from the beginning and how drastic, you know, it, uh, the onset was and thinking about the amount of people that do recover fully yeah. and the time it normally takes them when you're talking about a year, two years, and you you were basically, what, three? I think I was there for was there April, May, June, three months. And from yeah, exactly from being totally bed rest, you know, could yeah. not move a limb, so to say, and then yeah. be able to walk out and basically run out of the clinic, it felt amazing. And but also they they were happy. The the people running the clinic, all the therapists were super happy because they they knew we did something amazing together. That just that you can have someone that comes in and be like, oh my god. Are we going to get this person on his feet? And then it just three months later, I'm walking, running out of the clinic. It yeah. felt amazing. Yeah. And um, it feels like a team. They feel the triumph just. Yeah, they, I bet they see it the same way. You know, they, with all the work they put in, yeah. you get something out of it. Yeah. If you have a person that really, really wants something, it's amazing how much you can achieve. Yeah. It sounds, by the sound of it, and the stories I've heard, of course, in the contact we've had, and also the story today, that you you empowered also a lot of people in on your journey that were a part of helping you, and and definitely me. And when I talk to Will and I talk to other friends of, that we have mutual friends we have, yeah, it is a, an empowering thing. And I guess you know it's not dissimilar the elements and what's involved in if you think about you know goals that we set for ourselves and what's involved in that you know going to the olympics or um setting a challenge of climbing 15 peaks or and you have a team together and you're setting out to do this thing that very few few people in the world have done and what it teaches you and the appreciation you've got you know and the depth for me also the human elements and the depth that you've been able to feel them both in losing the ability to do the basic things that we take for granted yeah but plus the process in fighting like a gladiator mm -hmm. the mental skills and growth that you've developed and the learning the process of going through that fight and and experiencing the elements of your basic human senses and the importance of you know just the whole process put such a highlight on life yeah and and what is the meaning of life and what what is the true meaning of life and the perspective we should have for ourselves in our own individual journey do would you say with all that thing com combined it may be a big thing to say but are you glad that you got team yes glad i'm probably not but it taught me an amazing lesson. Um, in a way, yes, yeah, sure, I'm glad that it happened now and not when I'm 80 to figure out what you should do or what you can do with life and not just work like an idiot and think that 
well, when I'm 65, I can relax, you know, I can enjoy life now. I can enjoy life every day. And that's something I figured out. I'm enjoying life in a whole different way. Like, yeah, working with horses is an amazing thing we do. And that's something I'm glad for to do every day. That some people, you know, pay to do what we do. I have made my passion, my, my profession, you know, so that's, you follow that. And if you have your passion as a work, you don't work a single day in your life. If you think about it, you know, I do what I love to do. And that's something I really figured out too, that I really like what I do. Sure. And uh, I like love this horses on the whole, the work we do with the whole, everything that's involved with the horses. I just love it. Sure. And that's something I really came back more and enjoy, enjoy life. Sure. The horses, the world, as I said, the sunsets. I enjoy, you know, when it rains, it just rains and it's, it feels amazing. And uh, yeah, if watching a rainbow, you just some the, the small things. I always was one of those, oh, look, a rainbow. Today I'll be like, oh my God, that, how beautiful it is. And the birds singing, you know, it's like normally you just walk by them and be like, okay, you don't hear them. Yeah. And today you just, oh, look, you hear those birds? Yeah. You see, it's the small things. It's very much the small things. I can stop by flowers. I normally just walk by flowers and be like, oh, I'm cute. Today I'll be like, Oh my God, look at these, this rose bushes is amazing. Yeah. And uh, that's something that really changed my whole perspective of life. Yeah. I see all these small things that I normally just walk by. And that is something that I may be glad that I get this uh, disease that, and also the, the contact with friends, instead of just being, oh, I call him tomorrow. You call him right now because tomorrow may look very different. Yeah. You don't even know if you, and tomorrow's going to show up. Yeah. And don't go to bed being angry with someone or your wife or spouse, whatever. Yeah. Clear it before because you don't know what tomorrow's going to look like. Yeah. That's something I will figure out quite fast too. Do you think people can get that appreciation of life and what life has to offer without going through something? How will you try to, will you try to influence like you're influencing me whenever I speak to you now, I think, yeah, geez, I didn't, I don't take time for that. Yeah. I'm actually terrible in a lot of my friendships. I'm neglecting them. And it's one of the things I have to work on. And I like reminding, reminding yourself, reminding people that this is. Now I do hope that you could inspire some people to just slow down in life. Or people that think they don't have anything and you're like, you have a lot, you know, be grateful for what you have. You have a family, you have a healthy kid or something like that. You know, yeah. be as healthy. It's just for me, the, the biggest thing you can have, if you're healthy, you're so much further. And, um, if I could just inspire one person yeah. to be like, oh, yeah. he's not totally whack of out there, you know, yeah. maybe there's something to do with it. I should enjoy every second I get, you know, you get this, as I said, you get, I don't know how many seconds in a day, but there's a lot. <laughs> if you can, yes, take stop it for you yeah, and just enjoy it and don't take a little bit of stress out of your life and just yeah. stand there in the sun. Yes. Oh yeah, this feels great. Yeah. And yes, then take two deep breath where yeah. yes, feel alive. And then you will walk on. You feel so much better. Yeah. yeah. I can tell you, man, I've enjoyed every second of this and after this podcast is released you'll be inspiring a lot more than one person yeah. <laughs> in the world yeah. so thank you very much again i appreciate our friendship your generosity to sit here and to share your story with everybody else everybody can find you if they want to follow your journey further because this man is going to do some incredible things if you sit here across the table from him and you feel the energy that is coming out of this man i can tell you he's going to be doing some amazing things in the very near future which he of course has done many things up until this point so follow christopher cc dressage thank you for tuning in guys and we look forward to seeing you next time